His life hasn't been the same since the summer of the summit. He spent time in jail, his wife left him, he lost his house and his job. But tonight, Byron Sonny is celebrating. CTV's Michelle Dubé has more. Acquitted of all charges, Byron Sonny emerged from the courthouse, in his words, high on happiness. It's just an utter vindic vindication of everything. Found not guilty of possessing explosive substances and counseling to commit mischief, the 39 year old hugged his parents and thanked supporters. Overcome with relief, the two year ordeal is over. And I just hoped that justice would prevail, and it did. Sonny was arrested just days before the G20 summit, accused of plotting to attack it. He took hundreds of photos of the security fence and surveillance cameras, pointing out security flaws online. Police searched his Forest Hill home and found a slew of chemicals, all legal, but when combined, could be used to make a bomb. And just last month, information heard during the court proceedings directed police back to the house where they dug up containers of potassium chlorate in his backyard. But all along, the IT professional and self-described security geek insisted he was innocent, that his hobbies include rocketry, chemistry, and he just wanted to see if he could expose gaps in the billion-dollar G20 security plan. I got kind of sick of them making my city look like it was some kind of like an armed camp. Justice Nancy Spies took nearly two hours to go over her reasoning and deliver the verdict. In the end, she was not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the chemicals were in his possession for the purpose of creating explosive substances. The judge reasoned it was plausible the materials were there for things like rocket making and gardening. It is a very detailed, very thorough judgment, uh, and it picked apart each and every argument put forward by the Crown and ultimately rejected those arguments. Sonny spent 11 months behind bars before he was released on bail. His wife left him, he lost his house, career, and has spent all his savings. So where does he go from here? It's about uh, trying to get my life uh, back in order, get my uh, career uh, rehabilitated. But first... Total freedom. Total, total freedom! A celebratory pint with friends. Michelle Dubé, CTV News. Uh, lecture makes it sound like it's uh, a lot more organized or structured than it's uh, it's going to be. Um, actually, you're gonna you're in for a bit of a, a Luddite uh, throwback experience tonight since I actually have cards and uh, not a PowerPoint. Um, well, geez, where exactly to begin? Um, I think you covered it uh, pretty good there. Um, I think uh, a lot of what I really have to offer of value in terms of the uh, the experiences that I'm your typical sort of uh, boring white uh, middle class sort of computer guy. So uh, for a lot of people, my experience and what I've been through is their visibility into uh, sort of a part of the system that uh, you know they're they're seldom experienced with. Uh, you know, most people uh, tend to sort of uh, you know just not think about that, but uh, as the uh, the world continues to progress uh, politically as it is, there's going to be uh, more and more of uh, what would be perceived as your average sort of middle class people uh, going behind bars. But uh, just just to be uh, a little accurate about things, it's it was in a jail, but uh, technically technically there's a sort of a difference between uh, pretrial custody and um, actually you know being in jail proper. At the same time, the difference is that uh, pretrial custody is actually um tends to be a little bit worse than actually being in jail properly because um, there's uh, resources that are specifically assigned to people that have uh, already been convicted that uh, are not available to people that are in pretrial custody and basically I guess that's because they assume that uh, you're only going to be in there a week or two or you know a month so you don't need access to the alcohol counseling programs you know whatever else that goes on. Now when you're in there for 11 months it becomes a little bit of a problem um, so, yeah, flashcards. Um, I tend to get a little bit flustered when I uh, speak because I, I find this stuff uh, incredibly unnerving. So, um, so let's talk about the, uh, the G20 experience in my own words. It, um, the whole genesis of this idea started because uh, I've always been sort of interested in security or at least when people tell you not to do things or don't go in a specific place, that's uh, every bit as good as an invitation to me to uh, to go ahead and uh, to do that and uh, but for years you know for years even before 9-11 you would always hear about uh, you know p people sort of expressing their enter anti-government uh, paranoia what do I have to do to get on this kind of a list what do I have to do before I can't cross the border and people would say well don't go and order these chemicals or don't go and order that uh, you'll wind up on a list ha 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 
And, and I'd been hearing this for years, and I finally, I, one day I sort of just had enough, and I decided, well, what exactly, uh, see if I can be a little more stylish here, hold on. Uh, what exactly does it take to wind up on a list? You know, because everybody talks about this, kind of curious to see what had happened. So I figured, well, I'm going to see exactly what it takes. Um, so I, I sort of worked through numerous ideas. I mean, a lot of those were visiting the sketchy websites, you know, like you, you, you would expect, you know, things for, um, I don't know, you know, bombs, militia, paranoid stuff, you know, super left stuff, super right stuff, um, you know, Zionist, you know, whatever kind of things, you know, racist sites, just anything that would purposely try and attract attention. You know, anytime somebody would say, do not go and do these things or look in these things, you know, don't go to the library and check out a copy of, you know, books by, you know, whatever horrible historical figure. Um, so I just decided to go out and start doing these things. Um, then I crossed into the States numerous times, you know, have, having family down there, conferences like DEF CON and stuff, nothing. Nothing, no problems, nobody ever stopped me, nothing. As, as well, you know, as it should be in a proper, you, you would expect open democratic society. So then it's like, let's start turning up the experience. Um, so then I decided to actually start ordering things like, uh, and I figured the easiest way to find out what's gonna attract attention is to look at things that are restricted. So I went to actual government websites, specifically, you know, like Industry Canada, Mines and Natural Resources, all these things, to look for, you know, precursor lists for uh, explosives or drugs. And then just <laughs> start going through that list and ordering these things. Things that, uh, okay, just put context, like I'm about 40 years old, so actually exactly 40 years old. And when I was in high school, you used to be able to play around with a lot of good chemicals in your high school class. You know, you could probably set stuff on fire. You could blow shit up. Now you don't get any of the interesting things in high school. So I, I don't know. They're, expect, they're, they're afraid of equipping uh, children or something with the knowledge of things that can do horrible things. So in any case, I wanted to start getting uh, a lot of these chemicals uh, that were restricted and sort of as a bit of a flash in the past, or sorry, a, a bit of a flashback to the past because these were a lot of the same things that you used to be able to play with in high school chemistry labs that you can't anymore. So that sort of says to me that the only difference between now and then is that there's, there's been a shift in the political environment. People are more afraid of what people can do with things. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with these things. If 30 years ago you're allowed to play with this and all of a sudden now you're a terrorist if you want to order this. But a lot of these things you can find by just ordering from aquarium supply shops, um, hydroponic shops, everything you need to go out and commit horrible, you know, acts of loss of life, you can find at Home Depot, Canadian Tire, all these things. So I just started going through to these stores and ordering them on my own credit card, on these things, trying to throw up as many flags as possible. And then I still crossed into the States and it was no problem. Um, now, quite likely that's because I'm just this boring white dude with a European name. Now, if I had had some brown skin and my name was Mohammed or something like that, it might have been an entirely different thing. If I've already been on lists for being of a particular religious belief or political belief, then maybe it would have been a problem. But when you're just your average middle-class guy, not a big deal, average middle-class white guy. Um, so, starting doing all these things, what can I do to find out if I have thrown up any flags since I'm crossing the border okay. So I start applying for various government licenses. Um, some of the things I did were first and foremost uh, applying for like restricted and non-restricted uh, gun licenses in Canada. Now being Canadians we automatically have this sort of guns make us nervous. We expect that it's very hard to get guns in Canada. It's about a three-day course. It's a piece of cake. Anybody can do it. The trick with it is, is that in order to complete the process, you have to, um, you have to send your paperwork out to uh, New Brunswick to the, um, I guess, an RCMP office. So you get checked through the RCMP, and then you get checked through all, you know, domestic intelligence agencies and criminal records and stuff like that. Mine came back with flying colors. Also got my private investigator's license, flying colors. That involves, like, uh, at least a provincial level background check. Um, so clearly, here I am, average guy who's ordered all kinds of chemicals, might as well have been, you know, like a, a Timothy McVeigh, you know, sort of situation. And um, nothing, nothing. Um, so that sort of struck me as, uh, as kind of curious because uh, said to me that, 
nothing really happens if you're just part of, you know, sort of a regular sort of group of people. Then the G20 comes to town, and that, that's when things, uh, things started changing. Um, it's funny because you would expect that uh, domestic intelligence agencies would have been uh, over a lot of these things, but uh, through the court system, the way I found out that I actually uh, got snagged was um, basically by my uh, Twitter posts and a, uh, my uh, blog posts. And it wasn't by somebody that was specifically tasked with uh, G20 um, intelligence gathering or stuff like that. It was from somebody in a police station or an office uh, somewhere up in Barrie who was just flipping through the internet for G20 stuff uh, and just happened to see, oh, I wonder who this guy is. You know, he's posting about um, taking apart microwaves and trying to make death rays with them, uh, which is all tongue-in-cheek because it's, I don't know, part of my problem is, is that it's hard to communicate sarcasm or ridiculousness across the internet. You know, it's just you can't communicate a tone of voice. Maybe I should have put more smiley faces. Maybe I should have put, maybe I should have used a colon instead of a semicolon or something to make, I, I don't know. But in any case, they sort of didn't get the, uh, the humor or at least the sarcasm behind it. And from that point, I found that they uh, then linked me to my blog and then looked through this. And then they found that, um, well, I guess it, it's sort of fair to say that my, um, my political beliefs are... Well, I'll just, you know, come out of the closet here. I'm basically like a, a staunch anarchist. And just to be clear, you know, I just need to give a little context here that uh, anarchism is not chaos. I'm looking at it as a, as a pure sort of democracy where there are no leaders. If there are leaders, they're assigned for basic tasks, and then they get subsumed back into the regular pool. It's a, it's a flat hierarchy. There's no oppression, you know, there's no, you know, it, it's basically people being free uh, to be and do exactly, you know, what they want. Um, while respecting other people in terms of democracy, which is sort of, you know, like a group of people, you know, the biggest group of people gets to say what goes and then, you know, so, so with posts that uh, discussed, you know, anarchist politics or at least, you know, stuff more to the left, uh, they started looking at that and then when I started doing security analysis, or security analysis maybe sounds glorified, when I started picking holes uh, in the, um, some of the uh, security arrangements like defenses, you know, I, I mean, Ever since I'm a kid, you know, I've, ever since I've been a kid, my, uh, one of my things that I've really liked to do is just, you know, figure out how I would get around security arrangements, you know, whether it was uh, watching World War II movies as a commando or, or things like this. I mean, we're criminalizing people on one hand for practicing skills and, and being clever that uh, are, are lauded on another hand if they happen to be, you know, working on the side of, 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 you know, good and righteousness, or I should say, you know, structure, order, the system kind of thing. Um, so once I started saying that, uh, you know, they've replaced a regular, you know, chain link fence with a, a new kind of fence that had small holes in it, and then I, I noticed, well, the holes in the fence are small enough that you can actually thread a bolt through them, and then that would give you traction or, you know, the ability to lift or climb or pull down a fence. So then they started looking, oh my god, here's a guy who's talking about, um, you know, trying to t knock satellites out of orbit with a microwave. Here's a guy who's, <laughs> here's a guy who's talking about, you know, like, uh, like large-scale model rocketry. Um, you know, it, it sort of takes you back to high school, you know, when you're the geek or the nerd, and, you know, here's the jocks, and they just don't understand why you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or shit like that, you know, and it's just that... I mean, look at Mythbusters, right? You know, it's just like, I don't know how many of us go home and watch Mythbusters instead of going home and watching, you know, like Jersey Shore or some other crap pop TV or something, but, you know, there, there's a real cultural disconnect between, you know, inventive, creative, explorative people and, I guess, whatever else is out there, you know, the status quo. I mean, there's shows like Large Dangerous Rocket Ships hosted by Carrie Byron from Mythbusters, and that's essentially what I was doing in my basement. Uh, is trying to construct or at least work out the chemistry and the arrangements for large rocket engines. It just so happens that, you know, the physics and chemistry behind that are exactly the same thing you need if you want to make large destructive weapons like Timothy McVeigh. And the funny thing is, is that none of the actual chemicals are illegal. L the law states basically you're allowed to possess all these things. It only becomes criminalized when you have intent to perform a certain thing. So the problem is that you wind up with an arbitrary enforcement of the law that's based on whoever is enforcing it, what they think is going on. So, you know, when you get the G20 coming to town and you have, you know, like 
you know, Obama and, you know, his security forces and world leaders. And then you have, you know, nut bar militias in the states that are getting arrested before this. People just, they look for anything. And there's automatically trying to, you know, find a, a scapegoat to, sure that, to show that they've been during, uh, doing their work. And what sounds, you know, more attractive than like, oh, here's a chance for us to express that we're not just going after, you know, like sting operations on, you know, people in the Islamic community. Here is, you know, a nice white bread boy that lives in a Jewish neighborhood. You know, oh my God, look at this. Here's a perfect, you know, dream domestic terrorist, you know, and it's just it's so absolutely ridiculous. So all this stuff starts happening. Somebody's probably having, a, you know, a, a wet dream up in some intelligence agency headquarters. And then apparently, and a lot of this I can at least talk about now, uh, finding out through court records and stuff that I had been put under surveillance for about, uh, I think, nine days preceding my arrest by a team of about nine people that, uh, you know, were following me around. Um, interestingly enough, apparently, if you're being followed by the cops in Toronto, you can just go into the subways and they'll, they'll lose you. So I, I don't know. They're not particularly good at following people. Um, so... Where the story really sort of starts and uh, where everybody else, where you guys sort of, where it comes in for everybody is, you know, like newspaper, you know, all of a sudden somebody arrested, you know, for me it started uh, like about 11 or 11.20, I was heading down to Hack Lab in Kensington Market in Toronto, so I'll hop on the bus in Bathurst up by Eglinton, and then uh, we're, we're going south, um, and we just cross St. Clair. And, uh, you know, I hear this whoop, whoop, you know, sort of like the siren noise. And, uh, if, oh, you know, it's an ambulance or something like that, cop, whatever, you know. We, so the bus pulls over to the side. We're going about four minutes uh, just sitting there. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? And then all of a sudden, you know, the doors open. I'm like, well, screw this. I'm just going to get off the bus. And I see this, you know, nice you know, police gentleman walk on. And it's just like, uh, are you Byron Sonny? And, you, you know, when a police officer just walks on a bus in traffic, and calls you by your name, it's not usually a good thing. Um, so I figured something was going on. I wasn't sure exactly what it was, but you know, I, I had some imagination that, you know, it, given all the things I've been doing, it was something related to the G20 in Toronto. But I had no idea what the rest of my future was going to look like at that point. N who can think of that? And um, so, you know, get thrown in the back of a cruiser, all nice and polite taken down to, uh, I can't remember the exact division, but it's at the, uh, the foot of uh, Avenue and Eglinton Road, and this is where things started going the south, or started going south. So I was basically locked uh, in a questioning room for about uh, 14 hours, and for 12 of those hours, I had literally uh, no contact with a lawyer or anybody in the outside world, and we found out through court records that they had actually hung a sign on the door no contact with law, lawyer or anybody for 12 hours. Like, you know, it's, and it's very clear, you know, that, that when the situation becomes extreme, people are willing to let rights sort of slip and slide and, and play things loose. You know, like, you go home, you watch Law & Order on TV, you know, and you see these little things, well, we don't actually have to tell him he was arrested or tell his lawyer where he was within a certain amount of time. You know, and then by the time his lawyer finds out where he is, well, it's still within that 24 hours, so it's fine. But they'll do everything they can to throw a wrench in the works to slow down your access to a lawyer. And because they know that you're terrified, you're isolated, you're, you know, you're, you're away from anything that gives you any kind of comfort. As soon as you have access to a lawyer, that's a connection to the outside world. That, that is a very strong emotional support mechanism. They want you tired, cold, hungry, alone, isolated. And that's what I was. So the first thing that happened was I'm in a room. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, you're sort of Orwell room 101. I mean, there weren't rats in cages or anything. But, you know, it, it's a sort of dirty, dingy, surgical steel chair strapped to the, you know, bolted to the floor, that kind of thing. Uh, in there for, I guess, about 45 minutes, you know, they want you to wait, soften up a bit. And uh, a couple guys come in. And it was totally like a Laurel and Hardy. Literally like, you know, tall, thin guy, short, fat guy. You know, it's a... Pat Garrett, or actually I, the guy's name was I believe Pat Garrett, which is amusing because I actually think that's the guy who shot Billy the Kid in the back, if I'm not mistaken. So, good name there. Um, and uh, Detective or whatever, Shane Hill. And these guys were from the, the intelligence uh, squad or whatever they call them in Toronto. Like Every police organization has its own sort of intelligence division. 
And it's funny because you start talking about being investigated by intelligence divisions and things like this, and people automatically think like, oh, you know, you're just paranoid or making shit up, self-aggrandizement. But these things are real, you know, like these things exist. These, they, they go out there and they talk to people. Like if, if you've a member of any kind of like really sort of like far left or right political party, I mean, like these people are looking into you. They're, they're checking out your websites, they're going to your meetings, they're talking to you, and you, you might not even notice this. So believe me, we're, we're not some perfect little hands-off democracy. Like, our, our government is every bit as bad as the states, and probably worse, because at least the states, they have to admit and declassify stuff after a period of time. Canada, our government doesn't ever have to unclassify anything, ever. Even the British have to do. We have the most secretive government probably in the, in the Commonwealth. I don't know about Australia, but they've, they've got their own problems down there with censorship. So, so then, you know, so you're basically getting worked over by like low grade intelligence agencies. Um, you know, and they're like, well, who do you know? You know, what are you doing? Like, uh, what groups are you a member of? Um, you know, what are your political beliefs? You know, and you're just like, okay, well, you know, the standard kind of things, you know, and then there's like, you know, the good cop, bad cop thing. Just like on Law and Order, you know, the one guy's just like, ah, oh, you know, your life's over, and shit, ah, you know, and then the other guy's just like, hey, you know, calm down. It's like, hey, do you need to use the washroom? Let, you know, let me take you. Can I get you a sandwich? You know, just, just ridiculous. All, all these things. It, it really is kind of that comical. But the thing is, it works. Because when you're scared shitless like that, your defense mechanisms are down. So these, these tricks that they use, uh, it might seem comical, but when you're terrified, you know, it, 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 it can be surprisingly effective. And uh, what really started freaking me out was when they started asking me, well, you know, it's like, what are your opinions on, like, Israel and, and Palestine and, and, and Gaza? And, and, you know, and you're like, holy shit. You know, like, what, what do they think? Have you had any contacts with militias in the States? You know, like, what are, what are your views on, you know, like, uh, you know, like, like uh, white supremacy and, you know, or black people and things like this? You know, like, it really feels like, you know, they're running through a list and, and trying to figure out you know, like, like, well, what can we pin on this guy? Or it's just, it's crazy. It's like, literally, these people spend all day cooped up in their office, running through scenarios of terrorism and stuff like this. So they're just, they, they can't wait to get, to get out, you know, get out of the office and find some of the stuff for real. You know what I mean? It, it's just like, it must be like students out of a uh, university or something, you know, where it's just like, y you've been taught all these wonderful things that, you know, you want to apply, but you know, life is a lot more banal, stupid, boring, and simple you know, than the exceptions you're taught how to deal with. And so it, it just started going south from there. And then eventually I got to talk to a lawyer who manages to, you know, tell me to shut up, which I didn't do from the start, which you should really never talk to the police ever, anything. You, you can't get your way out of, you know, you can't talk your way out of this thing. If you say to the, you know, the police, like, I love my grandmother, they'll be writing down, you know, he loves his grandmother, you know, will be willing to, to, to kill people for his grandmother. In fact, he's probably planning to kill people right now for his grandmother. You know, like, they, they, you can't say anything to make yourself seem better. Um, so at this point, you know, I, I finally, you know, shut up. And then I, you know, you got your nice little metal bench down in uh, the holding in the uh, police station. And then, you know, I wake up the next day and then I get, uh, get up to the shuttle in, uh, you know, on the shuttle up to, to Maplehurst. And, uh, you know, at this point, uh, you know, you're tired, you're hungry. I'm wondering what's going on, you know, with, with my wife, my parents, things like this, you know. And um, you're just removed from everything. So I finally get up to Milton, get checked in, you know, you go through, you know, what's your religion, what's your dietary stuff, all these things. You know, they give you a fine orange jumpsuit. And then you're basically thrown into a sort of a prison population. Uh, anybody familiar with the TV show Oz? Or at least passing references. Okay. Like I used to, uh, well, it's a show about American, American jails, like maximum security stuff, right? So I grew up on this. And we've all seen these TV shows in the States, right? You know, it's just like, there's always a, well, you know, don't drop the soap. Or, you know, if you go to jail, make sure to take out the biggest guy first so you're respected, you know. And so I'm full of all this shit in my head, you know. I'm, I'm terrified that I've just been arrested. You know, I'm a skinny, you know, white dude or something. I've got about three hours till I'm shanked and raped in the shower. I'm just, just absolutely terrified, you know, what's going to happen. And it turns out to be generally a pretty Canadian experience. I mean, nobody really wants to mess with anybody, you know. It, it, it's... 
if you're quiet, if you're humble, you know, if you're polite, if you just ask before things, uh, before doing things, um, it's pretty easy to get along. I mean, the, the biggest problem in jail is, is boredom. Um, but in terms of, it's not, and granted this is Maplehurst, you know, the, the Milton Hilton, and it's not the Don, but uh, even after doing time in Maplehurst, I, I was informed by the other guys, it's like, you'd probably be able to do time in the Don, you know, without worrying about it, you know, without being subject to violence. So there's a huge cultural disconnect between jail in Canada and jail in the States. You cannot rely on what you see in TV. Um, you cannot rely on what you hear about another province necessarily. I mean, Ontario is apparently fairly shitty jails. If you go to the East Coast, you know, you get a whole big, you know, codfish and mashed potatoes for, for dinner. Huge, huge food. They're a lot more hospitable on the East Coast. Ontario sucks, apparently. Uh, West Coast is supposed to be pretty good as well. Um, so basically, you're generally, you're, you're stuck into this thing that if, if you want to get the closest experience possible is, is an over-militaristic high school that you can never leave, where you're forced into your room at certain amounts, or sorry, certain times during the day, dressed a certain way on a very fixed schedule. Uh, the same awful cinder blocks and pastel colors that were in your high school, very much like this, and, but you can just never leave. Now, of course, everybody's very, you know, emotional, you're stressed out, um, you know, people are wondering about, you know, what's going on with their family, you know, it's like they just got arrested, what's going on with their dog and cat, they live alone, who's going to feed them? You know, you're, at, you're among people that are at their, their worst, their, their shittiest, you know, their saddest, their most depressed. Um, so generally, most people, they don't want the extra hassle. And um, it was particularly interesting in my case, because uh, they had cleared out an extra range for us, so it was just one... Uh, area, like if, if you want to look at a jail, just imagine, you know, you're sort of a bunch of pods that can fit about, uh, there's about uh, five ranges per pod and each range has about uh, 32 people. And they'd cleared out a whole range just for G20 stuff. So I was there for about 12 hours just by myself, you know, and, and it, it's shaped like a pie, right? So there's, there's one dude, you know, sitting here in jail with all the other pods looking at you. Up at the glass, like, what the hell did this guy do that there's a whole range just for him? <laughs> you know? And it's just like, what, what did this pale, skinny, wimpy-looking white dude do? Like, holy shit! You know, and um, so then, um, then, you know, 18 hours, another guy comes, and I found out that he's in there because uh, he was walking downtown, and there's a cop there, and he's like, well, you know, what's going on with all you cops? You know, there's a bomb on top of that building. Maybe you should go look at that. Boom, he's in. Then the next day or a day later, um, there's the, uh, there was a gentleman with a chainsaw, a chainsaw Gary uh, McCullough, uh, who was brought in. And uh, just because he was coming back from, I guess, you know, Paulton region or whatever, stopped in Toronto, had like a crossbow, gasoline, all kinds of stuff in his car and parked in a security area and not good. So he wound up in there. And it was all of us for about three days trying to figure out how to work this busted ass TV up there. And wondering what the hell's going on with our country, you know, because... This is the kind of thing you hear about in other places. Um, and then Saturday hits, and that's when the real G20s come in, you know, like the people that were part of, you know, like Southern Ontario anarchist resistance, you know, anti-war at Laurier, you know, people like uh, Alex Hundert and things like that. Um, and so there's about 15 of us in this range, and all the other people are, you know, at the other ranges looking at us. It seems to me, looking back on this, it was a bit counterproductive because here's somebody that they're afraid that is a radical or is harboring radical tendencies, but they're not sure. Let's just, a lot of this was all preventative. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what this person is capable of. Let's arrest them. Let's take them out of circulation and let's let some other branch of the system worry about it later. We'll just use this arbitrary bullshit to take people out of circulation and it'll sort itself out. And that's the whole problem with this whole thing is, it's very, very, very hard to sit there and point a finger at somebody and say, they maliciously deprived me of my rights. They wanted to screw me over. We want to do this. We want to take... A lot of this was just poor planning. People that were, you know, like stressed out. I, has anybody ever worked in the public sector before? Like worked in hospitals, right? I, I don't know if anybody's worked in a hospital before, but imagine something that's like that or a public school system. Now... The people that run this structure, these organizations, are now in control of your rights, your freedoms, your ability to, to live your life. You know, they, these people that deal with forms and, you know, like, like 
transferring from one extension to another to get something taken care of are now depriving you of your rights and putting you in jail and taking your freedom away. It's, it's ridiculous. But there's very, very little maliciousness that's out there. And the maliciousness that, or sorry, like, I mean, like, just acute maliciousness that, you, you know, like this person just, you know, if it was out in the middle of nowhere, they'd kill me. There's very little of anything like that. All that you see that really manifests itself uh, at that level is, is things like guards, you know, and these are people that are just, you know, like, it sucks to be in jail, but imagine what it's like to be a guard, you know, like you're, you're basically, everybody, you come into work, everybody hates you. All the people you're looking at would basically love to kill you given a chance, you know, and what is your whole job to deprive your fellow like sisters and brothers of their freedom? You know, there's, there's got to be anybody with half a bit of a social conscience has to know that they're, they're not doing something right. You know, you, you can fool yourself only so long into thinking that you're taking rapists and child molesters off the street and that you're, you're all that stands between society and chaos. But on the other hand, you're going to have to realize that you're part of this, this horribly rotten thing. So I think there's a lot of self-denial that goes on. So the guards lash out when people sort of start uh, asserting themselves because they just don't want to deal with the brokenness of the system, right? It's just their job. They just want to come in, do their eight hours, punch out, go home. I've had guards that come up to me, and one guard that was just like, look, this is just a job. You know, I really don't give a shit about this. In fact, you know, like I have the same politics as you, but it's all fine and dandy, but you know, there are plenty of people in the 40s in Germany that said the same thing and that didn't turn out so well. And plenty of the guards and people that are always like, well, you know, I'm just doing my job. Well, that didn't work at Nuremberg. That's not going to work now. And I'm sorry that I have to Godwin this whole thing in now, but you would figure that over like 50 or 60 years since that's elapsed that people would have taken those sort of lessons to heart that you don't get to say it's just a job. Everything you do, every single second of, of the life you live, you know, has an effect on something. And it's, it's not just you going to your job. You know, it's you shaping the world. So I, I, there's just some really unfortunate things that uh, go on with guards there. Um, I think I've gone a little off track here. Sorry, definitely a, a little nervous with this. Um, so yeah, so they basically take somebody that's radical or they're afraid of being radical and put them in jail with, honest to God, real radicals. So I had 11 months to basically sit there and sort out, you know, political philosophies, you know, go through all these kind of things. And now what's been done is they've taken a guy who, you know, wanted to teach activists and people like, you know, email encryption, file encryption, you know, how to protect your security, your safety, you know, somebody that was just harboring, you know, very maybe loose, um, abstract ideas about state oppression, about, you know, what's going on and put him in jail with people that are actually affected you know, by this, people that have been infiltrated by, you know, government plants, people that have had roommates for two years, two years, you know, the government was putting people in these little sort of social groups, political groups, you know, and just, just listen to what they're saying, you know, listen to what your roommate's saying, listen to what your roommate is doing, and then report back to us. I mean, there's a reason that all these people, all these agitators like uh, Leah Henderson, uh, Kelly Flugback, a lot of these people were, were arrested so quickly is because, like, so many people had already been infiltrated. All these names have already been, you know, on a list somewhere. And um, these things happen in this country. I mean, you can look what happened with uh, Tommy Douglas and the RCMP. You know, like like somebody that was, you know, you know, like a founder of healthcare in Canada. They've only recently declassified, you know, the fact that they'd been monitoring him for, you know, like suspected, you know, communist stuff like that. So there is a. Um, there's a very strange, very prejudiced old boys network in Canada that uh, is, is very much like you would expect um, the stereotypical American, you know, pro-capitalism, pro-right-wing operating up here. Um, and it's not just paranoia. Um, now, the problem is, is that once you wind up in the system, it's next to impossible to get out. Because every branch, you know, the cops say, it's not our fault, we got it from the, cr you know, the, the other investigators, you know, and then the, the crown is like, well, it's not our fault, it's the cops. So everybody starts pointing the fingers at each other, and it's up to you to basically try and clear up these messes. There's already been a, sort of a, um, a minimum bar of evidence to, to already get you uh, sort of locked up, and then, you know, 
you get your bail trial, and if you don't pull that off, then you're, then you're in until a bail appeal, and that's next to impossible. Uh, <clears throat> and the way it works is that um, they just basically will come up with a completely sort of rotten search warrant um, and hoist you by your, uh, your own petards, your own, your own blog posts. All of a sudden, everything, you've do, everything you do that you've never thought about in the past is now underneath a microscope. Every little comment. Uh, the comment, for instance, that uh, got my wife arrested and basically led to the dissolution of my marriage um, was that uh, I'd been working on a microwave project um, and I would wait till she was out of the house uh, because basically I didn't either want to sterilize her or myself because we were trying to have kids at the time. <laughs> and um, she had said on one of my blog posts, it's like, well, you know, just don't blow the house up. You know, you make me smile. I love you. Now, when all of a sudden you're being investigated for, you know, making organic explosives and trying to kill Obama with a potato cannon, you know, all these bizarre theories that they're cooking up, to all of a sudden have a blog comment from your wife that says, you know, don't blow the house up, well, holy shit, that's all the evidence they need. You know, oh my God, she must be part of the, she knows that he's doing something in the house that can blow it up. So then they rope you in, or sorry, then they roped her in, and then started basically like, I don't know if anybody's seen the interrogation videos of, of you know, me on the internet, but they basically just very bluntly bring it out, you know, it's like, you, you got to help us get your wife off, you know, like, uh, you know, what's going on here? Explain these comments, you know, and, and basically, like, they will use every bit of uh, leverage against you. And it, it's just the whole arbitrariness of this thing is you can get away with murder until you fall underneath the microscope. Once you're underneath the microscope, there's no way in hell for you to get out. So one of the things I would advise to you is just don't let them <laughs> don't let them look anywhere near you. Um, don't let them look at your activities. Don't basically just get in trouble. Because uh, once you do, you just, you can't get out. And that's a problem because that becomes a real chilling effect. Because if you care about the world and you care about what's going on, you can't just sit back and be quiet. You can't just sit back and, and do nothing. So it inevitably puts people that have a strong social conscience or at least people that are really annoyed with things and how they're going and want to, to change things, it puts them into direct conflict with a system that's looking for aberrations. Um, it's a very nice parallel to um, anybody familiar with uh, intrusion detection systems or like IDS or intrusion prevention systems? Well, you know, they're, they're devices we put on our, our networks that basically look for anomalies. Uh, and the idea is you run it for a while, you look at your network traffic, you get a baseline. And you need to do that because the people think, I'll just put this box on, my, box on my network and it'll look for any kind of attack and stop it and tell me what's going on. It sounds like a nice idea, but the reality of, of life on the internet is that there's people, if this was a street, there's people running every two seconds around jiggling, jiggling your doorknob, lifting your door sash to see if it's open. There's always something going on in your network that's an anomaly. So these systems don't really work. It sounds like somebody says, you know, we catch 99.999% of, uh, of problems. You know, we can determine that they're not anomalies. We don't give you all this awful noise. Well, 99.999% sounds frigging phenomenal, right? But what happens when you have like 10 million events? That's, I, I don't know, my math sucks, but let's say that's something like 10,000 or 100, what, what does anybody know? Well, it's a lot, you know, like you, you, can, you, you can be to, to a huge percentage and still if you have enough situations you're wading through tons of shit you're wading through tons of things that you need to determine are legitimate attacks or a misconfiguration or somebody that doesn't know what they're doing and it becomes like that for the legal system they just start looking for people they they it probably is software it probably is things like you know maltigo or palantir or stuff like this uh packages where they fire in you know, okay, well, let's look for all these people that have these political beliefs. Let's put on all these chemicals. Let's put in all these credit card numbers that are tied to chemical purchases. Let's throw all this data into it, and let's look for the anomalies that pop up. There's so much out there, we don't know what to do, so we're just going to take these anomalies, and you know what? Let's take them maybe out of circulation. Let them sort themselves out, you know, through the legal system, and then we'll see how, you know, it all winds up later. And, and that's how it works. There's, there's no great deal of human oversight you pop up on a list somewhere, somebody automatically assumes that because you're on that list, somebody else must have legitimately put you on that list, and you're done. It, it, it's, 
they're looking for anomalies and you're going to become an anomaly. And you know what nowadays? Sticking up for your rights, taking social action, chaining yourself in front of a building that's about to be shut down and made in the condos two years later when it could be used for housing people that are cold and hungry and don't have a place to live. You know what? That all of a sudden shows up as an anomaly now. Asking for unionized rights is an anomaly. Asking not to be treated, you know, like, like a slut because of, you know, provocative clothing, you know, all of a sudden becomes an anomaly, you know. So things like any political, you know, marches, like, so you get things like uh, the casseroles or slut walk or anything, all of a sudden these become anomalies, you know. They, there was something in Toronto recently where a police officer was written down, like, he arrested the women specifically because they had hairy legs. And because in the anarchist community, you know, like you shave your legs, that's a symbol of, you know, male hierarchical oppression. So automatically, if you do that, well, you must be an anarchist. If you're an anarchist, then that means you don't support the government, and that means that you're basically willing to hurt cops or do all kinds of things like this. So a simple anomaly of being female and not shaving your legs is now enough to basically wind you up in jail overnight and put it up to you to clear yourself. So it's not unique that it happened to me, you know. And... Um, and I had it light and easy in jail. You, you enter into these things, you enter into a situation like jail and you realize that everything they say about the system and, you know, like racist overtones is absolutely true. You know, like it, it's ridiculous. You know, like I, I would have guys, it's like, well, now you know what we go through every day. They can't walk, you, imagine walking through your own neighborhood. You live there and you can't walk up to your own house without a cop driving by and say, you know, what are you doing here? You know, it's like, well, I live here. You just look suspicious by the very virtue of your, your skin. Or people that have like longer hair or dress like goss and wear black clothing. Well, now you're automatically under suspicion for other things. So the problem is, is that we're using this outmoded system of just looking for people that don't fit a mold. And the problem is, is that, you know, I, I know there's a lot of administrators and artists and you go to any, I think, decent hacker space, something at Hack Lab, you know, where you have a large population of people that look different or are, you know, like a large LGBT population, people that live alternative lifestyles. Well, at what point is it going to be, you know, is all of a sudden, oh my, you know, like being gay is now going to be an anomaly or being, you know, Muslim is now going to be an anomaly. Well, it already is an anomaly now. If you're Muslim, they're probably already looking at you. You see these things and then you get to see how it sort of impacts itself or sorry, impacts, you know, the population at large. So it's, it's really quite horrible. Um, the media, I don't really have too much of a problem in this case. Um, and I think that's mostly because I sort of decided to try and play the media from the start because I realized, you know, how could this go? I mean, if, uh, if anybody's going to talk shit about me, I think I, I'm going to be the one to talk shit about me first. So... Because, you know, you could just see how this this would go, you know, like bombs, you know, Obama, things coming to town. They're just going to make you look like a nut bar. So I decided to reach out and just talk to somebody, uh, Denise Balkastoon from Toronto Life, and get my side of the uh, the story out. And uh, it generally worked out pretty good because uh, I got it long enough. Sorry, I got it in soon enough that it sort of became like a source article for, for a lot of the uh, the different things. And uh, it, it's, it's about 95% accurate. There's a, there's a few things that I said that were either stupid or that I didn't properly appreciate or I didn't express and she didn't sort of quite understand. But all in all, it, it's very accurate. So, um, but you play with the, the press at your risk. And it's funny because, I mean, I knew from the start that for all the people that were, you know, castigating me for what I did, that uh, as soon as I was acquitted, if I, sorry, if I was acquitted, they would just say, uh, oh, well, clearly Mr. Sonny's already guilty. That's just that the Crown did a shitty job, so we know he's guilty. And I know that if I was found guilty, they would have just said, well, clearly he was guilty all along. And you can see it with, you know, like the American um, presidential debates. You know, it's just like the same debate. It's like Kennedy versus Nixon, you know. If you, for the people that like one guy, it's like, oh, my God, he totally won. But then the other side is saying, no, our guy totally won. And, it, it, you know, so it's, it's just... Uh, it's it's very strange. Um, so I, I would caution reaching out to the media, but uh, I would also at this time say that it was one of the the better things I did because at least got my side of the uh, the story out there. And uh, I mean, with you don't have access to the internet, you don't have access to basically anything in there except for a, a crappy phone system that doesn't work half the time. So 
in order to get your side of the story out there, you really have to either have a good social media network of friends that can do it for you. Uh, and if you're not sure about that, then uh, you, can, you can reach out to the papers. And uh, God bless the Toronto Star, I have that much to say. They've been continually uh, giving it to the, uh, the police, and uh, well-deservedly so. Um, let's see. So I, I can't say that uh, I think the media failed to do its job in this case. Uh, I think that uh, if I'd been found guilty, they would have, you know, made it their own way. Uh, if I'd been found, you know, found, you're not found innocent, you're only found not guilty. Um, and it worked out that way. But uh, they're, they're self-serving. You just have to make sure that uh, you can find a way for their self-serving interests to serve your interests. And in this case, uh, it overlapped. Um, this isn't a classic case of being... Oh, what, what's my time like? Uh, 45 minutes. Oh, shit. Um, I don't think it was a, a classic case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time uh, because I was sort of poking at the system, looking to see what happened. It's, um, it's like if I had a 10-foot pole and I was poking at a wasp's, wasp's nest, you know, I was maybe expecting to see it fall down and run away and say, well, you know, haha. Except in this case, I poked at it and it fell down and it lodged right over top of my head, down to the shoulders, and I didn't get my head out for 11 months. Um, I think I've already expressed a good bit about my thoughts about the Canadian legal and justice system, and... Uh, but to just put it more bluntly, it, it's that it's broken, and the only justice you have is the justice you can buy. Uh, my bills so far totaled have probably been about uh, a minimum of a half million, probably quarter, close to about three quarters of a million. And a lot of that has been from initially my parents, and then the, uh, the rest of it was paid out of the uh, divorce settlement from my, uh, my wife's family. So at least that part of it was, uh, was good, um, marrying Rich, but uh, at the same time... <laughs> It, it, it really stings because it was never about money for me. And that's, that's been the most painful thing through this whole thing is, is the, uh, you know, the dissolution of my marriage and loss of a life partner. Because it makes you wonder, you know, like, well, the way I was raised, you know, you, you give your last drop of blood, you give your last dollar for the person you love. You know, like if I was in another country, sorry, if my partner was in another country, you know, she was in a Saudi Arabian jail or something, let's say that happened. First thing I would be is, well, how am I getting plane tickets over there? How am I hiring the A-team or, or some other kind of mercenary group? How am I to, to bust her out and get her back home? So to, to not have that extended to me it is just, I just, I can't comprehend it and I'm still working through that. So you really start to learn who the people you sort of the people in your life, uh, what they're like when they're tested. Everything sounds all fine and dandy, but, uh, you know, when, where the rubber meets the road, you know, is where you really find out the people uh, in your life, what they're like, if they're dependable. And I, I've only lost, yeah, like, the, well, you know, the, 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 um, the, the ex-life partner and her family. Otherwise, I've got more friends than I've ever had. My, my family, you know, they, did, they never backed away for a second. They're right there by my side. So... I've, I've done something right with my life, at least, to be surrounded by, um, you know, such high-quality high people. But, yeah, uh, in terms of the legal system, uh, yeah, you, you, you have to have a lot of money. And, you know, I've backed up by a lot of people, you know, significant amounts of uh, money. Now, what about these guys that, you know, live at Jane and Finch and have nothing? Nobody. They're in this country alone. They're not even a Canadian citizen. They have no mother, no father, no brother, no sister, no friends. Nobody put $20 in their canteen account every couple of weeks so they can write a letter or get a candy bar. You know, like what, what right do I have to complain about anything compared to most of the people in there? You know, we really, uh, we really are privileged. And uh, you have to, you know, and I got dealt a lot of understanding in jail from the, you know, the other uh, anarchists in there about... Um, you know, thoughts, political thoughts such as, you know, intersectionality, you know, that, you know, the systems of oppression, they, they intersect, you know, and it's not just, you know, the fact that you're white, you know, it's that you're white, you're male, you're heterosexual, you know, you have, you have privilege that you don't even know you have. And then you go to jail and you say, oh my God, you know, all this, this theoretical stuff that you either talk about in university or, or in little leftist talk groups, you start seeing it in real life and you realize that it's, it's every bit as worse and even more worse than that. So e everything you hear about, you know, the system and oppression is <laughs> absolutely legitimately true. Um, the most positive thing from all of this was I've got an amazing connection, sorry, network of connections now. 
you know, like if they wanted to put people that were of, you know, different political, sorry, of the same political stripe, you know, if, if they wanted to jeopardize that, you know, and break up communication networks and prevent people from working together, they, they accomplished the exact opposite. You know, they put all of us together in places for the same months, you know, people that had little bits of skills in this, you know, people that had uh, this kind of idea but didn't have the skills. Now we all talk to each other, you know. So many people are in communications now, you know. We've, we've got people that, um, you know, have the willpower and people that have the skills. It, it's all the same group. Now, you know, everybody's sort of starting to realize that, you know, regardless of whatever your small variation political belief is, you know, it, it's, it's, we're all, you know, we're all painting the same picture, but with just different colors. And that's, the, uh, you know, our country's broken. Uh, it's very broken. And, you know, we need to start getting back to, uh, you know, something more freedom oriented, more, I just, I, I don't really know how to put it. Um, Let's see, uh, how did you feel on the 15th of May when you were acquitted? It was, uh, it was fantastic. It was, uh, it was like a celebration, although the more I think about it, the more I realize that uh, it shouldn't have been that much of a celebration because it makes it sound like all of a sudden, you know, you're plus 100 in the ledger when what really happened was that you were just reset to zero and now you're allowed to, allowed to go on with your life. Um, luckily, I didn't pick a field like childcare to go into, in which case I'd never be working in that again. I, I picked something, you know, like computer security, where there's at least um, there's some kind of a rock star effect, you know, p with people like Kevin Mitnick or Kevin Polson or or um, <laughs> people like we, for instance. <laughs> you know, the the famous internet troll is that everybody sort of there's this this they, they love the bad boy. There's sort of uh, you know no publicity. Sorry, there's no such thing as bad publicity. So that's, that's kind of good, and I've, I've managed to get myself into a position where I'm doing um, a lot of good work now. Um, you know, good paying job, you know, life back together, and I'm interesting things. Uh, what I do now is I, I reverse engineer malware. I, you know, decompile software to look for, you know, things that do bad things. Um, so it's pretty technical. It's, uh, it's really entertaining. It's where I've always wanted to be. So I've, uh, I've sort of managed to wind up. Uh, where I've always wanted to be in my life. It's just that I, I had to wade through this incredible shit storm, but through the, uh, through the, the good grace of a lot of good friends and good people, I've, uh, I've managed to get through that. Um, I haven't covered half the things I wanted to talk about, but uh, I think I should probably better open this to some questions now, I think. So. And also, sorry for sounding like a rambling moron. So. Far from it. Far from it. Questions? Yeah, does, does anybody have any questions for Byron? Is, are, are people... Okay, I see a hand back there. Let's have the question. Um, yeah, that is one of the popular questions. And... Um, I think I, I've always said the same things, and it's you can't go back. It, it's sort of there's really no point thinking about it. You know, like um, <clears throat> I mean, if I if I could do that and go back in time, then I'd, I'd go back into the 40s and kill Hitler. I, I'd go and take out Stalin. You know, I, I'd 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 go back 500 years and invent you know like like vaccines to take care of you know. There's so many more useful things rather than just sort of like focusing on you know like like you know, some fool that, you know, got himself in trouble, however legitimate or illegitimate, you know, the cause is. Um, so honestly, I, I don't, you know, I mean, let's say there was a time machine and I could go back. Um, I'm not sure that I would change things now. Um, it might have been just the, the right thing at the right time. Um, it certainly will serve a useful legal precedent for other people. Uh, there was a lot of law trotted out that uh, hadn't really sort of been used before. So it amuses me to no end to think that possibly hundred years, hundreds of years in the future, people will still be arguing, you know, Regina versus Sonny as a precedent in legal courts. So, so there's that advantage. Um, yeah, I don't think I'd change anything because uh, where I am now is you know, pretty good. Good answer. <laughs> Very good answer. More questions, more questions? Back there. What's your question, sir? Chris. Hi. Hey. Yeah, that's a good question. That is that is a good question. Um, 
No, my uh, passport was actually uh, seized and uh, revoked on my, uh, my arrest. Uh, you do not have the right to a passport. It is not a human right. You do not have the right to travel outside of your country at will. We only have freedom of movement inside of Canada. So, The passport is property of the government, and it's not your passport. So, that being said, uh, now that I've been acquitted, I'm completely entitled to one. Um, I've done some sort of light probing, like I went out to, uh, to Vancouver, and my understanding is that in some cases, you know, the plane routes can take you over uh, American airspace briefly. Uh, in mine, they didn't, but I suffered no problems, at least boarding, so if there is some kind of CATS uh, pre-screening list, uh, then it doesn't apply to me. I'm working on getting my passport again. I'm, you know, free and clear to do it, uh, just because mostly I want to be able to attend, like, uh, you know, DEF CON and Black Hat in the States and, you know, just go and see friends down there. My brother lives in the States. Um, so we'll see, but I think the first case, uh, or the first test will be to hop on a bus or a train or, you know, just a car, day trip to, to Buffalo or, you know, come, like, you know, come up through Hamilton again like I used to and then, you know, go record shopping in the States or something. And then uh, see what happens there. Uh, I will definitely be <laughs> putting that on Twitter or Facebook so that if I do get Git mode, you know, people at least know the, uh, the last location where I was uh, admitted to be seen. So, um, but yeah, that's it uh, in terms of traveling. No, um, I am concerned that uh, it can impact traveling overseas just in case, you know, like, uh, I mean, in this case, like I have relatives in Denmark, for instance. So, I mean, I, hopefully we'll head north before heading over to uh, to Northern Europe. But if, uh, you know, for instance, for the state, let's say I make it on a no-fly list, well, then, you know, any connecting thing through the states, I'm going to be screwed. So it could uh, impact being able to see uh, family and loved ones. But that's, uh, I've only traveled inside Canada uh, since then. So, questions? Yes. Well, we, we don't know. I'm, uh, I can't say enough good things about the people at Hack Lab. They've been, uh, I mean, I, that's sort of my home hacker, well, not sort of, it is my home hacker space, that and uh, Site 3. And, um, I mean, the people did a lot of good things. There. They raised a, you know, a good chunk of cash, got me a, you know, a notebook that I could actually use. Um, <laughs> my God, like 12 months of house arrest without using a computer. Be a, there would be a couple cases of homicide in the paper if that was the case. Um, I'm not admitting to homicide, by the way. Um, so, let's see. There were instances of possibly people showing up at the lab. Or at least it's alleged, you know, it's like asking to be, uh, you know, like, can you help me hack somebody's email? Can you help me hack this uh, taxi dispatch system? I think that was it, you know. Or, sorry, not taxis. Um, hack somebody's, I think, cell phone because they were like a tow truck driver and they wanted to be able to horn in on uh, other wrecks so they could get there first and, uh, you know, steal the tows, things like that. Um, we're not sure if that's related or not, and, and that's a problem with a lot of this is, is that uh, people tend to be paranoid. People tend to sort of want to think the worst about things. Um, Well, you hear about things like that. I haven't, I, I don't know the specifics of that one. I mean, I know that uh, one of the guys that was uh, a witness uh, at my trial, this uh, good friend of mine, Frederick, um, he, the RCMP, you know, or sorry, the, uh, the police, um, well, they had, they, there's, you know, you have the police and then they are also, they get seconded to higher intelligence agencies. It was a guy called uh, Dave Ouellette who was seconded to something called INSET, the Integrated National Security Enforcement Team, which is sort of like these little, work groups that uh, get set up so you know there's a local cop but then he also deals with people that are either in you know like CSIS, RCMP and other higher agencies that they might not have told us that they exist or what their letters are um, so that they you know they ensure sort of like information being coordinated and you know dispatched between all the police agencies so this guy phones up you know it's like would you want to come in with you know give an interview before you testify you know so it may be subtle intimidation like this um, I've heard of people, you know, possibly being followed by cops, but then sometimes you wonder, you know, is this because of me? Is it because they're my friend? All of a sudden everybody starts wondering, well, you know, like, I have friends that are possibly involved in sketchy things that have nothing to do with me. 
You know, what if I had a friend that, you know, has like a grow up or something, you know, well now they're going to be wondering, is that because of me or is it because of the grow up, you know, or things like that. You know, it's just so all of a sudden everybody that becomes, everybody that uh, surrounds you, they start checking their lives. They start wondering, well, is this going to affect it? Um, my brother grew up with, uh, with a friend, uh, well, sort of friend of the family now, and uh, he was over in, in, uh, in England. He has a Scottish citizenship, his family's Scottish. And uh, so he was working for uh, like a large software company, you know, shall remain nameless. And so we were writing back and forth and he was told by his lawyer not to contact me because he was going for a job interview in England for a certain agency uh, that's you know, MI5 or 6 or something, at least a domestic intelligence agency because he, he does like database work and uh, you know, like the qu structured query, uh, sorry, um, query programming, you know, like a, a lot of this stuff. So it's just like, well, this wouldn't look good having somebody that works for a domestic intelligence agency talking to somebody that's in jail for something that's possibly terrorism related in another country. So you get little things like that. Um, but then again, sometimes you wonder if it's just, you know, is it a cop following them because of this or is it just, a cop doing it on his off time because he wants to be a dick. You know, it, it's, it's very hard to isolate police doing their job from police doing things outside of their own work, you know, because they, you know, they're people too, sadly. Um, so, it's hard to say. So, we're starting to run out of time. Is I'll take one more question. So, okay, we're going to fight for it. You over there, what is your question? Lila. You talked about the system being broken. I'm wondering if you have any ideas or suggestions as to how to fix that system. That's a big one. <laughs> Make the last one. Well, Western, Western culture has been working on this for 3,000 years, and we, we haven't really gotten any farther than, you know, you know Plato's Republic, you know, or Hobbes' Leviathan, or, or things like this. Um, I'm at the point where I'm not confident things can be fixed. You know, we're, we're becoming, we're sort of a duct tape culture. Our politics are duct tape. Our, our social structures are duct tape. Our relationships are duct tape. Our... our relationship with the environment is, is, is duct taped. We're making shit up as we go along and at a certain point it just becomes so rotten that you know we pretty much have to I think tear things down and start again. Um, this is where you know a lot of times people sort of start tuning out or they start thinking you're wacko because at some point eventually you know it's like viva la revolution and stuff like that. Um, you know and, and Revolution is always a good thing, you know, like fire has no friend. You start a fire, it'll burn you just as easily as it will what you want to burn down. So I, I can't say that uh, it's necessarily a good idea, but uh, I think we sort of need to sort of start from scratch. So, I mean, you know, my joke is I sort of pray for a, a zombie apocalypse um, because it kind of sounds fun um, or maybe not. Um, because there's just, yeah, it's just such a very big question, you know, and you start seeing this, uh, you know, in jail a lot, you know, when you're talking to people that have been, uh, you know, victims of oppression. Um, and it's just like, well, you know, we start thinking of Western, you know, how do we fix this part of our society that's broken now? Well, shit, you know, we can't even address what we've done to the people that were here first, like, you know, the indigenous peoples, you know, we haven't even, <laughs> we're still dealing with shit, how we've screwed them over hundreds of years ago and it's still ongoing we haven't even begun to address that properly how can we begin to address the problems in our own culture when everything that it's predicated on is is, is just you know like ridiculously oppressive and you know destructive to the environment and, and whatever came before so it, it's just like we can't start fixing from the top down you know we really need to sort of start building from the bottom up and that that's why i sort of you know I, i'm a strong advocate for uh for anarchism in terms of, you know, like a non-hierarchical organization, people working together in small groups uh, that coalesce into larger groups when needs require it and then dissipate back into it, back into like smaller, smaller things where, yeah, I mean, le leadership works. I mean, I think we all see 
that you know leaders can get things done but that's the danger is what happens when a leader gets something done and then they stay on too long and then becomes a cult of personality and then they're not useful anymore they're just holding on to the reins of power that won't give them up and that's a lot what we see now. I mean, like people seem to think that there's some difference between the liberals, NDP, and the conservatives, and the, the, the you know Democrats and Republicans in the states. When it's all the same party that's in power, it's different factions bickering among each other. It, it's pointless to vote in the system we have now because all we're doing is endorsing the least worst. When you vote, you're just rubber stamping a system, and you're giving them their okay for this crap to keep on going on. So I am basically, I suppose, advocating open revolution. Uh, I'd like it to be more peaceful. I'd like it to be more of an evolution. I'd like it to be more like what we see going on in our hacker spaces, you know, where a bunch of people together have similar things. We get together, we share, we teach. You know, art spaces, creative spaces. We see how that works on a smaller level, and I'd like to see that sort of parlayed into to a larger larger situation where it's just like networks made of smaller networks made of smaller networks instead of this whole top-down centralized people in some area dictating to people on the fringes what it should be you know and that's that's the that's the problem with democracy is it becomes tyranny of the majority it becomes a bunch of people ganging up on a bunch of other people and there's more of us so you do what we say whereas i think it needs to be more about everybody you know because you get a lot of people saying the same things well, that's great if they're all in favor of human rights. What if happens if you get a lot of people together saying the same thing that it's like, well, I think sex outside of marriage is bad. I think gay people are bad, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, it's not good. All of a sudden, I think now it becomes, I think unions are bad. I think organized labor is bad. I think, you know, standing up for your rights and questioning why the airport is doing things that don't actually secure us, you know, well, that's bad. So it's a, it's a very difficult question. But, uh, you know, and, and that's uh, one of the things I've always, uh, when I get letters from people, they'd always sign it, love, rage, and solidarity. And I, always, I thought it was maybe a little trite at first, but I try to sign that now because it makes a lot of sense, is that you can't have, you know, the rage that you feel has to come from love because it has to be, a, it has to drive a desire to make things better so that we can all, you know, live a more satisfying life. You know, like... Um, you know, like the, the definition of human happiness, I, I think it was also Plato that said it, is, you know, the, uh, the exercise of vital interests, sorry, the exercise of vital interests along lines of power, sorry, the exercise, the exercise of vital interests along lines of power in a life affording them scope. We need to be able to do what we're good at, what we want to do, and we need to have the opportunity to do that, and we need to be able to be free to do that. And we're not headed in that direction. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Byron.